What is happening, everybody? James Hancock here. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is right around the corner and I had the itch to cook up a video celebrating some of my all-time favorite comic book stories featuring the many characters who will be appearing on the show. Now, I love what Anthony Mackie and Sebastian Stan have done with these characters going back to 2014. They're easily two of my favorite characters in the entire MCU. But these characters, they've been around for many decades. And I think it's always important to remember where these characters come from and which tales have inspired these shows and movies that we also vigorously enjoy. Joy. But more importantly, I wanted to make a video about just how cool the supporting cast has always been in the pages of Captain America. Whether you're talking villains, allies, lovers, old war buddies, or partners, throughout the history of the character, as a solo title, Captain America has always enjoyed one of the coolest recurring cast of characters, one that I think too frequently gets overlooked. If you look at the various Nazis and mad scientists and super soldiers, just in Captain America's rogues gallery alone, his comic almost starts to feel as esoteric and nightmarish as a really good issue of Hellboy, given the comic really distinctive original flavor that really sets it apart from all the many adventures that he's had going out and doing battle alongside the Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Now, if you talk to any comic fanatic who's read a ton of comics, they'll probably agree that Batman has the best supporting cast in comic book history. But my question always is, who are the runner-ups? You could make a strong case for both Spider-Man as well as Superman as strong contenders. But for me, Cap's supporting cast is one of the big reasons why he's been my favorite superhero, going back to when I first discovered this incredible run by Roger Stern and John Byrne, collected here in this trade paperback. I read this thing so many times as a kid that the pages now are turning yellow and brown, but it's a fantastic read. And speaking of Stern and Byrne, the comic Captain America has always benefited tremendously from so many great storytellers, going all the way back to the early 1940s when Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, the king of comics, first cooked up the character. But just to mention a few more, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some total badass and for that I apologize, but we have Stan Lee, Jim Steranko, Gene Colan, Marv Wolfman, Steve Englehart, Sal Buscema, J.M.D. Mateus, Mike Zeck, Kieran Dwyer, Michael Lark, and my personal favorites, Ed Brubaker and Steve Epting. They've all played a key role in not only defining the character of Captain America, but also populating his world with some absolutely fascinating characters. And I'll say up front that when Ed Brubaker was writing the book for several years there, Captain America was my favorite monthly comic on the rack. In any event, this rant is not meant to be the definitive history of all these characters that would take days. Along with the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, this show is going to feature appearances by Helmut Zemo, Sharon Carter, a.k.a. Agent 13, Batrock the Leaper, Rhodey, a.k.a. War Machine, a new variation on the villain Flag Smasher, and the one that I'm most excited to see, John Walker, a.k.a. Super Patriot, a.k.a. the artist briefly known as the Crazy Captain America, who went on to become U.S. Agent. Now, most diehard comic book fans will agree that War Machine has always been more of an Iron Man character in the comics, but because he's in the show, I'm including a cool shout out for him as well that I think folks will enjoy. And I'm sure there'll be some other surprise appearances during the season, but these are the characters that I'm aware of at this time. So for now, think of this video as a combination of history lesson as well as guided tour through some of my favorite storylines throughout the history of Marvel Comics in which these amazing characters have appeared. So let's start with Sam Wilson, a.k.a. The Falcon, who also carried the shield as Captain America for a few years starting back in 2014. Cap has had many partners over the years like Rick Jones and Nomad and obviously Bucky. But The Falcon, he's appeared alongside him more than any other character. And just to put it in perspective, from 1971 to 1978, which included issues 134 all the way up to 222, Marvel even changed the title of the comic to Captain America and the Falcon. The one exception being issue 193 when Jack Kirby first returned to write and draw the book, but this collection is absolutely stunning. It's got some glorious art and it's just Jack Kirby in his prime. So if you want to see Captain America and the Falcon doing their thing with Jack Kirby at the height of his powers, definitely check out those issues. But the Falcon made his first appearance way back in Captain America 117 in the year 1969 when he teamed up with Captain America to stop a plot by the Red Skull. Initially he was just written as a social worker who has a really strong connection with his Falcon Red Wing, but but Steve Rogers encouraged him to put on the tights, become a symbol, and a new superhero was born. But what's interesting though is how, for a decent chunk of time, Falcon didn't have any wings. He would just swing around on ropes to get around. But then in Captain America 170, Black Panther stepped in and helped Sam with a massive upgrade to his gear and gave him his now signature wings. Years later, we got an excellent look at the inner workings of his wings in the official handbook of the Marvel Universe, issue number 15, which came out in 1984, and I was totally obsessed with it. In 1978, Falcon briefly joined the Defenders from issue 62 to 64, and I should mention that they're one of my all-time favorite teams. But then the following year, Falcon was persuaded by Captain America to join the Avengers, and what's interesting is how at that time, Falcon didn't want to join. 
The Avengers have been told by the government that in order to maintain their government support, they had to diversify their ranks. And as you can see in these panels, Falcon wasn't super psyched about the idea of being what he described as a token member due to his race. And his membership at this time would only last from Avengers 183 to 194, but he would rejoin at a later date. But one of the first comics with the Falcon that I actually bought right off the spinner rack in 7-Eleven was the first issue of his limited series in 1983. And this cover by Paul Smith, who would make a name for himself drawing an uncanny X-Men, the cover just looks so hardcore and intimidating to me at the time. I just loved it. And I should also add that Falcon has had his origin retconned to include a period of time where he was a bit of a thug named Snap Wilson. But this is what happens when you get cosmic cubes and supervillains involved in storylines messing with people's heads, which as you'll see is a recurring thing in the pages of Captain America. America. But in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead to my favorite comics featuring the Falcon. As I mentioned before, one of my all-time favorite comics is the Ed Brubaker run on Captain America, which started back in 2005. And you can see the first big collection right over my left shoulder, and that massive doorstopper of a comic is only a small part of the overall story. But this was the famous storyline that first brought Bucky back from the dead as the Winter Soldier and eventually led to him becoming Cap for a period of time while Captain America was dead. But during this run, pretty much every friend or enemy in Cap's life got to enjoy some of their best storylines ever, and Falcon was no exception. As drawn by Steve Epting, he just looks so damn cool, and he plays a crucial role in the scene where Captain America finally realizes that he doesn't want to kill the Winter Soldier like a lot of people at S.H.I.E.L.D. do, but instead he wants to try and save him. And then alongside Sharon Carter, Falcon is there when Cap uses the Cosmic Cube to restore Bucky's mind. And that damn cube is always popping up in these stories about these characters, including one of the all-time great combo covers that have ever laid eyes on. But what was interesting was how during Bucky's time carrying the shield, Falcon became his frequent wingman, no pun intended, as can be seen in these pages where they enjoy some light sparring. And while Falcon and the Winter Soldier did recently get their own book, I much prefer their days adventuring side by side when Ed Brubaker was handling the writing duties. But let's take a break from the heroes and discuss a bad guy. I think Cap is one of the best rogues galleries of any hero, and the villain that's close to the top, he's not at the top, and the top will always be Red Skull, but close to the top is Baron Helmut Zemo, the son of the classic villain Baron Heinrich Zemo. I first encountered him as the character Phoenix when he appeared in this weird comic book slash record combo where we'd lost the record and, and I tried to get my mother to read it to me, but she gave up after our single page because she couldn't understand how word balloons functioned. But the original comic was kept in America 168 from 1973. And in this issue, Helmut Zemo describes how he's seeking revenge for the death of his father, the inventor of Adhesive X. And we almost get into full-blown Joker ripoff territory when Helmut falls into a vat of Adhesive X at the end of the story. And then he returned years later in Captain America 276 to 278 as Baron Zemo, wearing a mask to hide his horribly disfigured face. And the story completely freaked me out as a kid, primarily because Mike Zek is one of the best artists ever to work in the industry, and he just imbues his characters with so much personality and emotion. But during this tale, Baron Zemo, he teams up with the classic Cap villain, Arnim Zola, along with the small army of monstrosities, making the tale feel more like a horror story than a superhero story, which for me cemented Zemo's rep as one one of the most sinister villains around, but the reason he's one of my all-time favorite villains is due to the classic story arc where he assembled a brand new Masters of Evil, many of whom had earlier appeared in Secret Wars, but then they proceeded to take over Avengers Mansion, crippling and maiming several noteworthy characters in the process, including Hercules himself, who nearly died from the injuries he sustained on the receiving end of this classic beatdown from some of the toughest villains in Marvel Comics. And then at the conclusion, just like when he first fell into the vat of adhesive X, once again, Zima makes the classic mistake of trying to use Cap's shield against him with disastrous results. I honestly thought he was dead at the time, but he would return later to create the fan favorite team, the Thunderbolts, basically villains masquerading as heroes. I struggled with that era of the comic because of my dislike for Mark Bagley's art style, but eventually the Thunderbolts would become one of the coolest teams imaginable once Warren Ellis had a turn on the title with a different lineup of characters. But now let's smack the tennis ball back to the hero's side of the court and talk about Sharon Carter, a.k.a. Agent 13, who actually shares her first appearance in 1966 alongside a classic Cap villain, Batrock Zeliper, who I'll be getting to in a bit. But they both first appeared back in Tales of Suspense number 75, a title that Iron Man and Captain America were sharing at that time before they split up into their own books. And I've got a collection of those stories right here that I absolutely love and adore, once again drawn by Jack Kirby. But then the title of Tales of Suspense was actually changed into Captain America with issue number 100 in 1968, an issue where Agent 13 in disguise is ordered by the earlier Baron Zemo to assassinate Captain America, but ends up having a team up instead with Captain America and Black Panther. 
And then she was inexplicably killed off in Captain America 233 in 1979, but was eventually brought back because nobody ever really dies in comics, not even Bucky. But all roads lead back to Ed Brubaker's run on the title, and it was during this time that we saw my favorite storyline, or storylines I should say, featuring Sharon Carter. What was great about how her character was used during this period was how she would kind of bounce back and forth between a bunch of different roles in Captain America's life, including being his handler for S.H.I.E.L.D., kind of watching out over him. She was also his wingman in the field, and then eventually even his lover, Naughty Naughty. But after being kidnapped by the Winter Soldier, she was actually the first person to inform Steve Rogers that his best friend from World War II was somehow still alive after all these years. And her story gets really hardcore at one point when she's captured by the Red Skull, who's interested in Cap's unborn child and her womb. It gets ugly. In any case, fans of this character should not miss any of Brubaker's now classic run. And since I mentioned Batroc, let's show him some love, even though I was once nearly laughed out of a comic book shop in Culver City, California, for buying a comic with Batroc on the cover. The cashier, he looked right in my face and just sneered, and he was like, Batroc the Leaper? But little did that cashier know that Batroc would eventually be played by the former welterweight and middleweight champion of the UFC, George St. Pierre. Now, it's easy to poke fun at this character for his outrageous French accent. It's not quite on the level of like a Monty Python parody, but it's close. But the man has style. He likes nice things. He likes beautiful women. And he's a legit martial arts expert specializing in savate. But the reason I'm such a fan is due to a brief story arc back in Captain America 251 and 252, drawn by the legendary John Byrne. It, once again, going back to this collection written by Roger Stern, but it was just absolutely fantastic. He teams up with Mr. Hyde, and they end up strapping Captain America to the front of a ship that will explode when it reaches the docks of New York. In the end, Batroc realizes he's chosen a poor partner in crime and teams up with Cap to beat seven shades of shit out of Mr. Hyde, and I can't wait to see GSP return to the character. Now, as I mentioned before, Rhodey's a character much more closely affiliated with the ongoing series Iron Man than Captain America. But because War Machine will be making an appearance on the show, I'm going to give a quick shout out to the days long before he became War Machine. That suit didn't appear until the early 90s, but James Rhodes, he was introduced in 1979 in Iron Man 118 and rapidly became a major character. Flash forward to Iron Man 169 in 1983, Tony had become such a drunken lush that he was basically stumbling around in his whitey tidies, unable to remember how to put on his suit. Consequently, Rhodey had to step in and fill in for Tony, and for several years there, he was Iron Man, including during Secret Wars, which you can see over my right shoulder, my well-thumbed trade paperback con collecting the entire 12-issue arc. But that's a story that I might have read more times than any other comic book story apart from the Dark Phoenix saga. I can vividly recall being in Carpool as a little kid, discussing each issue as they came out, and one of the unforgettable highlights of this epic saga was when Molecule Man dropped an entire mountain range right on top of our heroes, and they only survived due to Hulk's timely intervention. But their death was imminent nonetheless, so Mr. Fantastic, he quickly cooked up a way where Human Torch and the Monica Rambeau version of Captain Marvel could channel their power directly into Rhodey's suit, whereupon he incinerated half a mountain range, allowing them to escape. Even Rhodey was stunned at what he could do, and this scene became a major turning point in his evolution as Iron Man. But getting back to Cap supporting cast, let's talk about Flag Smasher. Now it appears as if in the show, Flag Smasher might be more of a terrorist organization than a single villain. We don't really have that much to go on, but we can totally discuss his appearances in the comics. He first came on the scene in 1985 in Captain America 312, and his whole shtick is that he's not a fan of nations or borders or what he perceives to be outmoded notions of patriotism. Nowadays, he would likely just rant and rave on social media, but this was the 80s, so he expressed his views by indulging in antisocial behavior like attacking the United Nations from time to time or getting into fights with Captain America. But he never really made that much of an impression on me, even though I kind of liked how he and his minions would go into battle on flying skis like they were auditioning to work for Cobra. But he finally impressed me in Captain America 348 when he took on the John Walker version of Captain America, a character who I'll be getting to in a few moments. But as drawn by Kieran Dwyer, Flag Smasher just looked so badass wielding this giant spiked mace while wearing an exoskeleton that had the ability to drain John Walker of his enhanced strength. He took him down only to end up teaming up with Steve Rogers the following issue as that giant story arc rushed headlong towards its major climax in issue 350. So now's the perfect time to discuss John Walker, who will be played by Wyatt Russell. I'm very excited for this character. He first appeared as Super Patriot in Captain America 323, and alongside his bold urban commandos, they represented a very different form of patriotism than that personified by Steve Rogers. Because Steve... He's both an idealist as well as a battle-hardened veteran of World War II, and he upholds a standard of character and conduct that very few can match. 
When he's written well, he basically represents the purest idea of the American dream. And let's just say that John Walker and his friends fell short. But when Steve Rogers proved to be too independent for someone in the U.S. government to tolerate, he was stripped of his uniform and shield, and John Walker was brought in to be his replacement alongside a new Bucky who would soon adapt the name Battlestar. Now, this all turned out to be a part of a giant elaborate plot hatched by the Red Skull, who is now living inside of a clone of Steve Rogers' body, and his goal was basically to tear down and ruin the reputation of Captain America. Meanwhile, Steve Rogers was now going by the name The Captain, with a killer new black suit and shield. Well, the Red Skull, his plan, it worked out really well, almost better than he expected, when John Walker proceeded to go stark raving fucking nuts after his parents were killed in the crossfire during one of his battles. And for the next few issues, I kind of became obsessed with John Walker, who developed this really evil, sinister smile as he went on this murderous rampage, just stomping people's guts out, including killing two of his old friends who were going by the names Right Winger and Left Winger, and the political implications of their names were totally lost to me at the time. I think I was 12. 12 or 11, but I was such a fan of Kieran Dwyer's art, he made John Walker just look so damn strong and unstoppable, at least until issue 350 when Steve Rogers and John Walker duked it out prior to this fantastic conclusion where the Red Skull ended up getting his pretty cloned face horribly disfigured to resemble an actual Red Skull instead of the mask that he always wore in the past. But then in the aftermath, Walker's personality, it settled a tad, and he ended up taking on the mantle U.S. agent and joining the West Coast Avengers in issue 44, where he would take part in all sorts of classic adventures. And last, but certainly not least, let's talk about James Buchanan Barnes, a.k.a. Bucky, a.k.a. the Winter Soldier, who was introduced all the way back, all the way back in Captain America Comics number one in March of 1941. And one thing I always like to point out is how the United States did not officially declare war on Germany until December 11th of 1941. The comic book business, however, clearly had already done so about eight months prior with this beautiful cover published by Marvel's predecessor, Timely Comics. What's crazy about these early comics is just how different Jack Kirby's art style was back then. It would take 40 more years before he reached his prime with all of his comics about the new gods. But when it comes to the character Bucky, he was very much a kid sidekick, which was a massive trope in the early 40s, frequently getting rescued by Cap as they faced all sorts of horrible monstrosities. And what's interesting about these early comics is how a lot of them don't really feel like superhero stories. They feel a lot more like horror comics. Now, in terms of publication history, Bucky continued to appear in comics well into the 1950s. But when Stan Lee started reinventing the comic book industry in the early 60s, he completely retconned Bucky's story in Avengers number four and came up with the now classic tale of Cap and Bucky disappearing at the end of World War II. Cap got frozen in ice, while the death of Bucky on their final mission would become a huge part of the fuel that would drive Cap as a character moving forward, much like the death of Uncle Ben for Spider-Man. And soon thereafter, Marvel published some really cool World War II flashback stories in the pages of Tales of Suspense, and from issues 63 to 71, we got to see a much more grown-up interpretation of Bucky. Gone were the days of Bucky as a kid sidekick, and he became much more of a partner. Someone who was in his late teens, which historically was par for the course for so many in World War II. My grandfather was a teenager when he volunteered to fight in World War II. But in terms of legacy, these tales would have a massive impact on Ed Brubaker and how he would approach the character many years later. And when it comes to legacy, one of the cool things about Bucky was how for many years, his influence was so often felt, even in comics where he never appeared. A perfect example is this collection of tales illustrated by the legendary Jim Steranko back in 1969, which was sadly only three issues, Captain America 110, 111, and 113, but is one of my favorite stories ever published in any medium. Rick Jones is front and center in this tale as he struggles to fill the role of Bucky as Cap goes to war with Hydra. Also, quick side note, back in the day, Captain America would smoke a pipe, which I think is cool as shit. But the legacy of Bucky and what he means to Cap proves to be this incredible burden and challenge for Rick Jones to try and overcome. And some of these splash pages straight up gave me nightmares as a little guy, which for me was always a positive. And I kept rereading these stories over and over and over again throughout my childhood. And decades later, I still find it impossible to put down once I start reading it. And then for several decades there, Bucky became became renowned or famous as the one character in comic books who would never come back from the dead. Over in the pages of Spidey, some writers would cheat and break a very similar rule with brief appearances by Uncle Ben and Gwen Stacy, even if they were spirits or ghosts or clones or whatever. But those two characters always had far bigger impact on Spider-Man by staying dead. So when it was rumored that Ed Brubaker was planning on bringing back Bucky, some readers at the time threw a massive shit fit in protest, but then something extraordinary happened. Brubaker proceeded to write one brilliant comic after another, and the winner Soldier became one of the most popular comic book characters of that decade, so much so 
that only a few years later he was appearing in the 2014 movie Captain America the Winter Soldier. And during his many years in the title, Brubaker did a beautiful job with so many of these characters. But Bucky, he was Brubaker's crowning achievement. He had all these incredible World War II flashbacks where you see him fighting giant monsters created by the Red Skull or zombies that have been engineered from American soldiers. And then we have all these incredible chapters where we see him as a ruthless, merciless villain. And then eventually we have this beautiful redemptive arc where he's fighting to reclaim his memories and his reputation and gets a very brief team up with Captain America before Captain America is killed, forcing Bucky to take up the shield and the costume for a short period of time till Steve Rogers returned from the dead. But it was during this period where we got this great love affair with Black Widow. And as I mentioned before, he had these really cool issues where he would team up with Falcon. But as a lifelong reader for me, this series, it's what comic books are all about. And it remains one of my favorite mainstream comic book stories that I've ever read. So this video is starting to turn out way longer than I anticipated. Initially, I foolishly thought this was something I could bang out really quickly. But as you can tell, I could talk about these characters for days. I am so damn fired up for this show. And I'm eagerly looking forward to cooking up more breakdowns and reviews once the show gets underway. But for now, if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell, and sharing the video on social media. I would greatly appreciate it. But thanks so much for watching, and more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.